My name is Talia. Hello, my name is Jacqueline. This is my baby sister, Vera. I'm Kiana. And I'm Peter. And, and we, we are, are the Verbatim family. family. Welcome, Welcome to, to Crosspoint Church. Church. Thank you for watching our virtual service today. Today, we're going to be talking about one of the greatest comebacks in history. If you would like to share any comments or questions during the message, you can do that right here using the comments or the chat feature. We would love to hear from you. Even though many of us are still watching from home, we are open for worship again. We have two services, one at 9 and a more family-friendly service at 10.30. We understand that not everyone's ready to come back, so we'll keep offering our unique services as a way to connect with you. No matter if you're watching from home or gathering in person, you are important to us. One of the things that we miss the most about gathering with our church family is seeing everyone smile each week. We are praying for you and for our church as we wait for the right time to go back and worship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Next week, we're gathering for our first outdoor service at Valley View Park in New Berlin. That service will start at 1030. Pastor Dave will share more about it in just a few minutes. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you are blessed by our virtual service today. Bye! Bye.
You loved us from the start We're waiting here for you With our hands Lifting high In praise And it's you We adore just after sunrise and I'm recording this on Saturday morning it's a beautiful morning and uh, the sun is still sort of peeking through the trees to my east and uh, I'm in my backyard and the reason I'm in my backyard is because I originally was planning to preach this morning from a cemetery and uh, New Berlin has a cemetery off of National Avenue it's the New Berlin Cemetery it's super old it's uh, it's a small town cemetery 
And um, my wife talked me out of it last night. She, uh, she thought it would be creepy. She reminded me that uh, I probably wouldn't last for 20 minutes by myself in a cemetery just after sunrise. Just considering that I am a little, uh, I can be a little scaredy cat sometimes. And I have seen my fair share of dead bodies. So um, I decided to do this from my backyard. I hope you're not disappointed. It was a last minute decision and uh, Anyways, you'll understand why I wanted to do it from a cemetery in a little while. But here I am in my backyard, and there's another reason I'm doing this just after sunrise. Because today we're going to look at a passage, a very well-known passage in the New Testament, that took place near a tomb just after sunrise. But before we get to that comeback story today, I want to share with you one of my favorite comeback stories of all time. I have always been, since I was a little kid, a Boston Red Sox fan. Now, I am, first and foremost, a Milwaukee Brewers fan. Brewers always come first, but the Red Sox are one of my favorite Major League Baseball teams. And in 2004, the Red Sox made one of the greatest comebacks in professional sports history. They were in the American League Championship Series against their arch nemesis, the New York Yankees. The, uh, the previous year, they had lost to the Yankees in Game 7 of the same series. Um, as the result of a walk-off home run uh, and it was devastating and so here the Boston Red Sox found themselves their backs against the wall against the Yankees again in 2004 they had lost the first two games in New York it's a seven game series uh, game three was in Boston and they got destroyed 19 to 8 game four seemed unnecessary um, the Yankees were leading late in the game and they brought in their closer, the greatest relief pitcher of all time, Mariano Rivera. I can remember watching the game live and thinking, "Is this is over. It's over. In fact, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, I went to bed. Well, here's what happened. Rivera walked the first batter. The Red Sox brought in a pinch runner who stole second base. And then Bill Miller ripped an RBI single to tie the game and send it into extra innings. And in the 12th inning, David Ortiz stepped up with a man on and hit a two-run home run to win the game. The Red Sox never looked back, and after being down 3 to nothing in Game 4, three games to nothing against Mariano Rivera with down a run, they went on to win eight straight games to become the world champions for the first time in 86 years. It might be the greatest comeback in the history of pro sports. There's an awesome documentary on the Red Sox comeback against the Yankees called Four Days in October. It's an ESPN 30 for 30 docu documentary. It's my favorite ESPN 30 for 30 documentary. You can check it out if you want to learn more about, uh, if you want to relive that 2004 comeback. Nobody expected the Boston Red Sox to make a comeback in 2004, especially Red Sox fans who were being interviewed during this whole thing. And even after game, the Game 4 win, they're like, yeah, this is just, you know, this is just a, a tease. They're not going to come back. We're used to this. They, we always lose. We're Red Sox fans. But the best comebacks are the ones that no one expects. And that is just one reason why the comeback we're going to read about today is... I think the greatest comeback that has ever happened. Nobody expected Jesus Christ to rise from the dead except Jesus. Even his closest followers did not think it was possible. Not a single one of the disciples believed in a resurrection or saw it coming until they saw Jesus' physical body face to face, his living body, his glorified body, days after he was buried. Jesus coming back to life after being publicly humiliated and executed on a Roman cross is better than every other comeback story we've ever heard and the best part about it is that it's true and in John's account one of Jesus closest disciples he wrote an account of Jesus life there's another comeback story that's easy to miss it's wrapped up in the resurrection story and it's that story that we're going to look at today I want to set up the scene for you Near the end of John's Gospel, Jesus is crucified and he died and he was buried in a new tomb 
and a very large rock was rolled over the entrance to the tomb. A couple days later, early in the morning, right after sunrise, a woman arrives at Jesus' tomb. And the four gospel writers, these are the guys who recorded the history of Jesus' entire life and ministry, like biographies, refer to this woman as Mary Magdalene. Who was Mary Magdalene? The first thing you should know about Mary Magdalene is that Magdalene isn't her last name. Mary was from the town of Magdala, and that's why she was called Mary of Magdalene, just like Jesus was from Nazareth, and he was referred to as sometimes the Nazarene. And Magdala was a kind of resort or party town on the western shores of Galilee. Kind of reminds me of a place like Cancun. You know, there's a, a lot of um, eating and drinking and partying, and uh, there's some immorality and corruption going on there. And she's mentioned 14 times in the Gospels, often in the company of other women who followed Jesus. There was a group of women who followed Jesus, uh, we're told by, by Luke, and Mary, more often than not, is towards the front of that list. When, when these women are mentioned, she had a prominent role in, in, the, in Jesus' entourage. He, uh, when Jesus found her, she was, uh, she was oppressed and suffering from demon possession. In fact, we're told she was possessed by seven demons. We're not sure if that's an exact number, but if, even if it's not, it would be a number that would indicate that her condition was very severe. And so it's, it's also commonly accepted that Jesus healed her from both men mental and physical illness. We're told that she was suffering from many kinds of infirmities. And when Jesus finds her, he completely heals her and restores her, her mind, her body, her spirit, into a right relationship with God. And she then devoted her life to following Jesus and serving him and the other disciples, which may have involved uh, funding for their journeys, uh, food, housing, probably more. She was one of the women who provided for Jesus and his disciples on their missionary journeys. We might summarize her comeback this way. She was a party girl from a party town. She suffered from physical and mental illness. She was possessed by demons. But when Jesus called her, she never looked back. She never left Jesus' side. She loved Jesus more than anyone. But what Mary is best known for happens in John chapter 20. Mary arrives at the tomb, as I said, early in the morning right after sunrise. She saw that the stone had been removed and the tomb was open. <clears throat> so right away she runs to Peter and John. And they weren't right around the corner. This would have been a good, a good run. And they are, of course, Peter and John, if you've read the Gospels, you know that they were Jesus' closest followers, two of Jesus' closest disciples, and she told them that someone had taken Jesus' body out of the tomb. She was extremely upset, and Peter and John immediately run to the tomb. Mary follows behind, and uh, the two men get there quite a bit ahead of Mary to find that Jesus is missing and the tomb is empty except for the linen cloths that used to be wrapped around Jesus' dead body. And, and then something weird happens, in my opinion. Peter and John went back to their homes. It says that they believed that Jesus was alive, but they went back to their homes. Mary finally gets there, and no, no one's there. Well, almost no one. And she is standing just outside the tomb, crying. She's devastated. And I'm going to read the text this morning from John chapter 20. Before I do, would you join me in prayer, please? God, we thank you for your word. We believe, God, that it's true we believe that it's your word to us. We believe, God, that these events happened. We believe they're eyewitness accounts. And we, God, we, we bank our lives on it. That Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. According to the scriptures. That we might have peace with you and life everlasting. We pray, Father, that you'd open your word to us this morning. Give us understanding. Give us hope. And God, let us have a genuine encounter with the risen Christ so that we might be changed and made new in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen to this amazing narrative in John chapter 20 beginning in verse 14. It's talking about Mary. She turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? 
Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. God chose this woman to be the first person to have a life-changing encounter with the risen Christ. And as always, there are some questions we should ask about this passage. Uh, first, why did God choose a woman to be the first to see Jesus alive? And why this woman, a woman with demons in her past? Why doesn't Mary recognize Jesus? She has heard Jesus say, and so did the disciples. They all heard Jesus say time and time again, I, I'm going to... I'm going to be killed and I'm going, to, I'm going to rise again on the third day. And yet when Mary sees the empty tomb, she doesn't say, He did it! He's alive! Instead of joy, she's filled with grief and thinks someone has stolen his body. Now, I don't know for sure why Mary couldn't see Jesus. There's a lot of different ideas out there. It might have just been because she was so upset and there's tears in her eyes and she keeps looking at the tomb. And seeing Jesus alive isn't even a possibility in her mind. It wasn't, she didn't even have a category for that. But I do know that every single one of us has a very thick, hard layer of, of sin wrapped around our heart. And one thing sin always does is sin blinds us. Sin deceives us. Sin keeps people from seeing Jesus. We are so consumed with ourselves and our wants in our dreams, that we can't see Jesus even when he's right there in front of us. And the only way that that will change is if Jesus calls us by name. And that's exactly what he does with Mary. One moment she is grieving and the next moment she is overjoyed. And that happened with one word, Mary. She had probably heard Jesus call her name a thousand times, but when he says it here, the light comes on. She can see Jesus as he is, not as she wants him to be. And she will never see Jesus the same way again. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4-6, through 6, the Apostle Paul wrote, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For God said, Let light shine out of darkness and made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So how does someone go from being spiritually blind to spiritually seeing, to seeing Jesus? Every great comeback starts with Jesus calling a sinner's name. That's how every uh, life transformation starts in the spiritual realm. In John chapter 10, Jesus was talking to a group of people. He's using metaphors to describe his relationship with his followers. And one of the metaphors he sometimes used was the metaphor of sheep and shepherds. Um, shepherding was a very common job and way of life in Jesus' day. And so he's talking about his sheep. And this is what he says in John chapter 10 verse 3. He calls, he's talking about himself, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And then down in verse 27, he says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Jesus was nearly killed for saying that. But think about those words, that everyone who was changed by Jesus experienced something they never had before. Jesus called them by name and he led them out. He led them out of darkness, out of bondage, out of the realm where everyone just does whatever feels right for them. He speaks to them. He calls them personally. This is a deeply personal experience being called by Jesus. And they, his sheep, Jesus' followers, listen to his voice. They will hear many voices in this world, as we are right now. 
but they recognize Jesus' voice and they listen to him above all the other voices. When Jesus speaks, they can see again. They are re-centered and refreshed and recalibrated when they hear Jesus' name. They have confidence knowing they will never again be guilty and condemned by God. They will never again be shut out. They will never again be abandoned. They will never again be alone because now they are known by God. God knows them and he calls them. He knows them as they are and he calls them as they are. That's one of the most amazing things about God is that he knows everything about us. He knit us together in our mother's womb he knows all the intimate details of our life. He sees through our hearts to our innermost person. He knows what's in our hearts. He knows all the good and all the bad. And he chooses to love and accept us. Not because of us, but because of Jesus. And when we respond to the call of Jesus, there is a loyalty to Jesus and a love for Jesus that makes us different. That, that detaches us from everything else in this world and all those other loves that we have in this world. You know, Jesus used sheep to illustrate this kind of love and calling and choosing, but I think we might be more familiar with dogs today. Many of you are dog owners. My wife and I, um, our family owns a dog. Uh, she's a, a very large uh, lab mastiff mix, and she's 10 years old. She's getting old now, but this whole encounter with Jesus reminds me of when masters call their dogs. And just, I don't want you to be offended here, but think about dogs are dogs and humans aren't all that different. Dogs are simple. Dogs need a master. Dogs are followers. Dogs are, are brave and loyal and predictable. And humans are very much the same. The cool thing about dogs is when they've been loved and trained well, they respond when their master calls their name. They stop whatever they were doing and they run to their master and they are happy to do it. The only time that our dog Piper doesn't respond, I mean, it's funny, if Piper's in a room and she's always with us, she just wants to be with us wherever we are and your dog's probably the same. And if we're, you know, if our family is in uh, the main room of the house and we're just sitting around talking or laughing or arguing, whatever, we're, whatever it is we're doing, and all of a sudden, someone says Piper in the conversation, her ears perk up. She, she can't understand almost anything that we're saying. But when someone says her name, she immediately looks up and she comes over. Um, and whatever she's doing, it doesn't matter. If I'm anywhere in the house and I want to take her on a walk or, or let her outside... I put fresh water in her bowl. I'll just say Piper, and we're from wherever she is in the house, doesn't matter what she's doing, she immediately comes to me. She answers the call because she's loyal, because she loves me in the way that dogs do. She wants to please me. She comes when I call her. And Jesus has called each one of us by name. And, and that's why most of us... That's why most of you are watching. That's why most of you come to church. Uh, are we talking about some mystical experience where we actually hear the audible voice of Jesus? No, that's not what we're talking about. So don't feel like I, I haven't heard Jesus' voice before. We're talking about a, a um, not a mystical experience. We're not talking about hearing Jesus' actual voice. What we are talking about is a very real experience where we respond to God's word or the preaching of the gospel and or the message of Jesus and we are irreversibly changed. Something happened inside of us. Something happened inside of us that changed our orientation towards God. It All of a sudden our, our desires for what those things we used to love start to fade into the background and we, did, we start to have this desire for God. We start to want to know God, to to be in God's presence, to please God. Those are things that come from God. We start to understand God as He truly is, not as we want Him to be. We start to surrender those things that used to have a hold on us, those desires, those dreams, those loves that used to drive us. And now we have a new heart and a new mind that wants God more than anything else. And that loves Jesus because Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one who 
made peace with God possible. He, Jesus is the one who brings us into the presence of God. He's the one who makes us acceptable to God. And it's, a, it's, it's very much like a homecoming. Just as the, the shepherd calls the sheep back into the gate, back into the pen, Jesus is calling us home to God, home to the Father. There's so many beautiful um, parables and stories in the, in the New Testament that Jesus told that, that give us that picture. One of the most famous ones is the, the homecoming of the prodigal son. And, and that's very much how we come back to God. We come back to God with nothing. We come back to God having, um, you know, gone our own way. But we come back and God welcomes us. He runs out to us and he embraces us and he welcomes us home. And we call that in the church very often repentance and faith. That's what responding to the call of Jesus um, involves, repentance and faith. So, so what does this have to do with Jesus? We've been asking that question every single week. And this is really important. <clears throat> Ever since Jesus rose from the dead and the, left the tomb, he has been calling sinners by name. That's what Jesus does. And my question for you today is, has he called your name? Sometimes I've wondered to myself, why did Jesus choose me? Why did God choose me? Who, who am I? What have, what have I done? The answer is nothing. And there's a reason that we have talked about women with a shady past the last couple of weeks. Last week we saw how Jesus chose a woman to reveal himself as the Messiah for the first time. This was a woman who had, had been married five times. She was living with her boyfriend. She was considered to be an inferior race by Jesus' people and Jesus' followers. Her, Jesus' disciples looked down on her. She believed that Jesus, just by his race and the family he was born into, was superior to her. You know, we know how, those, how damaging those attitudes can be. And yet Jesus chose her to be the first. The first person outside of his 12 disciples to see him as God's son, the savior of the world. And here, he chooses another woman to see him for the first time in his resurrected body. She's a reformed mental patient. She's not a leader in her community. She, many scholars believe she, she had a bit of a shady past. We don't know that for sure, but she certainly wouldn't have been someone the disciples would have chosen. And one of my favorite authors, Tim Keller, in his book, Encounters with Jesus, captures Jesus' attitude towards Mary and towards us beautifully in this quote. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. My salvation is not based on pedigree. It's not based on moral attainments, raw talent, level of effort, or track record. I've come not to call those who are strong, but to call those who are weak. Sometimes when I'm struggling uh, with worry or doubt or when I've failed or when I'm discouraged, I think back to the day when Jesus called my name. And you might not be able to remember the exact place and time, and that's okay, but I know that it happened. And I remember that Jesus calls me by name, that he knows me personally, that he knows everything I'm going through, everything I'm, th I'm thinking, everything I've done, and he loves me the same. There's nothing I could do that could cause Jesus to love me any more or less than he does right now. Because my name is written in his book. He chose me. He called me. He is my shepherd. He's my Lord. He's my master. He's my savior. He will never leave me. He will never abandon me. And because Jesus lives, I have come back to life. Have you come back to life? Will this be your tomb someday? Jesus calls you by name, my friend. And this means that this world is not your home. When Jesus calls you by name, he calls you out of this world. You are now a stranger here. You're an alien. You're not of this world anymore. You are born of the Spirit. Your loyalty is not first to your race or to your parents or to your spouse or to your political party. Your loyalty is to Jesus first. So let's listen to his voice above all the other voices this week that are shouting for our attention. And let's go tell the others 
that Jesus is alive. I want to thank you for joining me today, and I, I want to remind you that uh, our church is open now, but next Sunday on June 14th, we are going to meet for one service at 1030 at Valley View Park in New Berlin, which is right off a of sunny slope road. Uh, it's pretty easy to find the pavilion that we're meeting under. will be right on Sunny Slope Road. There's a basketball court there, and uh, it's going to be a great time of fellowship for us to come together as the church to be outdoors. Hopefully the weather will cooperate, and we're just going to have that one service. It's going to be a very um, unique and uh, an awesome day just as we get together as the church. And uh, then the following week we'll be back uh, back in the building for our 9 and 10.30 services. But we wanted to remind you that next week is a great opportunity. If you haven't come back to the building yet, we understand. We understand that these are uncertain times and that a lot of people are, are feeling uh, uneasy about, um, you know, the, the pandemic and everything surrounding that. So maybe you would consider coming to the outdoor service is a little fa uh, safer. You can spread out as much as you want. And uh, we're still going to be practicing some level, I'm sure, of social distancing, and uh, we're going to have markers um, set up so that people can, uh, you know, spread out and stuff like that. But it's still going to be a genuine time of worship and fellowship, and I hope that you will join us next Sunday on June 14th. also want to remind you that um, we appreciate your giving, and uh, there's a couple different ways you can give. You can mail uh, your gift to the, to the church if you choose to do that, um, or an easier way is just to go online, crosspointwestdallas.com slash give, or you can text this number. And um, we are continuing to look for opportunities to build up the body of Christ and also to reach out to our neighbors in the community to bless people who have needs and, uh, and also to continue to um, support our staff during this time. And so we appreciate all of your generosity, and, uh, and, and we are working hard to to determine how best to use the resources God has given us to accomplish our mission, which is to uh, redeem people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what our church is all about, making more disciples of Jesus. So I'd like to share the benediction with you today. Um, from Romans chapter 16, beginning in verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. I look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great week. Why don't you wait for Daddy to come into the picture? Look at Vivi! Look at you're on a video. Where's Vera? All right, Talia, start us off. Vera, Vera, look. Hello, my name is Talia. All right, let's all right, start Talia, that again. start again. Jocelyn, be ready this time. Talia, do you want to start us off again? Okay, go ahead. Hello, my name is Tiger. So, are, how are you gonna? Are you gonna craft this before you send it? No, you can at all. You just hear it. Oh, all right. He's gonna see how ugly we are in person. Got it. And he'll do the cropping. All right. Well, services is a way to connect with you. No matter if you're watching from home or gathering in person, you're important to us. You can do that right here during. Right here using the comments or chat feature. We would love to hear from you. Bye. 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 Do you think we can do that without the screen? I hope.